friend. Hi, my friend. <laughs> How are you? Everybody. <laughs> It's happening. It's Rachel happening. Carmel We're is here. on the Onward Book Club. Oh my God. It's so exciting. Um, everyone, if you could kindly send up a bunch of hearts so that she can see um, how much we love her. <laughs> that would be incredible. Um, hi, Liz and Rachel. I love how these are coming in. We love you. We love you. We love you. And <laughs> I'm going to let you all express your love. And then I'm going to turn the comments off so that you can um, <laughs> not have to have have Rachel's extraordinary face obscured by your comments. So mm, I get it. I get it. Go, turn off comedy. <laughs> okay. Now it's just the two of us alone with our friends. Yes. Rachel is here tonight Hi. to discuss her extraordinary memoir and manifesto, a renaissance of our own. She's got the hardcover. I've got the galley. <laughs> They've both got the same incredible cover. And you can't really see it, but I dressed tonight to try to match. I was literally about to say i love all of these colors and now i moved that it was to match the it is I, I mean this is what separates us from the lower mammals is our ability to better coordinate with our reading <laughs> with our friends books <laughs> it's very important that your that your clothing matches your reading material um and so before we begin i just want to read an introduction to the, the three of you out there who might not know who rachel cargill is <laughs> or who might not have read this book yet um this beautiful book once again it's called a renaissance of our own by rachel cargill is rooted in the idea that we contain many selves which are always evolving rachel herself has been many rachels the child of a single mother with a disability raised in subsidized housing a globally recognized activist, an educator, a philanthropist, a mentor, a Christian housewife in a small town, a New Yorker, an Air Force reservist, a CEO, and that's just so far. And I know that I'm leaving some out. She so generously shares her continual transformation with us authentically and bravely in real time on social media. And now in this book, A Renaissance of Our Own, which, because Rachel is an activist at heart, she doesn't just call a memoir, but also a memoir and a manifesto, because everything she does is personally and publicly revolutionary. She is genetically unable to consider her own story without applying what she has learned to the community at large who she serves and to the society around her, which she transforms by her own presence in every situation. And so with this book, she is inviting us on a collective journey toward new truths it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce my beloved friend, Rachel Cargill. Welcome to the Onward Book Club. Thank you. This is exactly where I want to be right now. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for um, bringing my book into the club, for your readers, for our shared conversations, for you to read it. We've had a few, I, we've had conversations about the book already, but this one is special because I know that this sits squarely in your passion for Onward Book Club. And so I'm excited to chat. Thank you, Liz. Rachel, can you tell us where you are in the, in the world physically right now? Yes, I'm currently in Akron, Ohio at my bookstore. Elizabeth That's right. Bookstop. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm in our little office right now, but we have some people who are live watching us on a big screen out inside Hi. of the bookstore. And, <laughs> so um, yeah, so Akron, Ohio is very happy for the Liz Gilbert High. <laughs> Hi, Akron, and the um, and I want you to tell us a little bit about the bookstore, but I also want to tell everybody that um, Elizabeths of Akron is the partner bookstore to the Onward Book Club. So this is a really big moment that we're doing yes. this um, in, a, in unitedly. Yes. Um, but if you could just tell everybody a little bit about how this bookstore came to be and why it's called Elizabeths. Yes. Aside from the fact <laughs> the that I adore reason, you. It's called Elizabeths. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I moved back to my hometown of Ohio in 2019 to care for my mother. And when I got here, I was really missing the types of bookstores that we had in New York City and in Brooklyn, the type that had um, a wide variety of authors that were giving a wide variety of perspectives. And I was looking around trying to find something and I'm like, okay, I'll just have to do it myself. And so I opened a bookstore where really the, the most clear basis is we have no cis het men on our shelves. We've heard enough from them. We're interested in every, any other perspective, <laughs> any other lens. 
of the world, of the human experience, of art, of literature, of storytelling. And so that's what our shelves are filled with. Everything from children's books, YA, cookbooks, um, all of these uh, all of these literary spaces. We want to be able to bring marginalized voices back to the center of, not back to the center, to the center of our canons. Um, I do this thing every year where I invite students to scour their syllabus, to go through their university syllabus and look up the photo of the authors. And if all of the people your professor is assigning you are a bunch of white men, say there's no way you're teaching me a varied perspective if the only people we're learning from is white men. So I tried to do that with the bookstore and it's named Elizabeth. Elizabeth, because Elizabeth is my middle name. And when I was younger, I used to beg my mother to call me Elizabeth. I would even draft up the note she could write to my teacher, like, dear teacher, Rachel will no longer be going by Rachel. It is now Elizabeth. And I would go ahead and draft it up for my mother. I'd be like, all you gotta do is sign it. All you have to do is sign it and I'll take it in. They'll change the roster. So um, this was a gift to my younger self. It was a gift to a version of myself that loved books, that loved reading, that was transformed by the literary world. And so, uh, yeah, it was a gift to my younger self. This is the most Rachel Elizabeth Cargill <laughs> story that could ever exist because just, I mean, we could just unpack everything that you just said and it would explain everything that you are <laughs> like you know and which I would say is rooted in like oh this thing didn't exist yet so I had to invent it um, I named it after the name I have chosen for myself that you will now call me says seven-year-old Rachel Cargill <laughs> too so I'm gonna change the I'm already gonna change the way I'm perceived by my teachers I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm going to tell the adults I am I how we're doing things from now on <laughs> with my own permission slip you know it's all in there like it's all in there and 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 also the community the idea of um, I'm gonna do something for everybody that is based on the things that I most love um, speaking of deciding what your name is mm -hmm. and who you are could you grace us, please, with the reading of the manifesto that is um, that begins this book and that that brings the word manifesto from the cover into into the pages of the book, yeah. and that I think is one of the most beautiful introductions to any memoir I have ever read. So, um, if you would kindly read us your manifesto, Rachel Elizabeth Carvel, I would be most grateful. Yes, yes. <clears throat> I am who I say I am. I shape my existence with curiosity and intention. I honor the spectrum of experiences I have had and will continue to have in this lifetime. Each experience adds to my understanding of the type of woman I decide to be. My highest values of ease, abundance, and opportunity give me guidance and recalibration toward my truth. They strengthen my yes and fortify my no. I walk confidently with the understanding that my choices are aligned. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody Please ever knows. gets through the Ever Book Club without crying, so just go right ahead. <laughs> I, I feel so silly. I'm, I'm in such a huge life um, moment, and reading this is just reminding me of myself, and I feel so grateful. Okay, oh. guys, I'm going to get it together. <laughs> don't, don't, I don't recommend getting it together. I don't okay, recommend yes, I'm just gonna getting it together. Just go ahead and fall apart here with just you Just go all. ahead. Okay. I mean, please. <laughs> <laughs> Why we don't want, um, as Ray, uh, my partner used to say to me, I don't want your zipped up self. Yes. I don't want your zipped up self. Um, just bring okay. your real self. Oh, I read oh, this. No, I'm gonna cry. Times. I read this so many times, Liz. I read this a billion times. Why am I doing this with my own words? <laughs> because it's what you need to you hear guys, right now. You guys, if you see me and Liz crying in a field together, you know that <laughs> we're just like going through a moment. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Because your own mm. words are what you need to hear right now. So keep reading it. It's Isn't it beautiful. wild? Yeah. It's wild how we speak to ourselves sometimes. Yeah. All right. I wrote this about a year ago, everyone. So I had no idea that I would need it later. My place in the world is sacred. No one knows me better than I know me. I honor and celebrate the ways my chosen self unfolds as I learn, grow, and shift. My beliefs are rooted in my trust that my current self, my younger self, and my older self are all partners on my path to well-being. I surround myself with people who affirm safety, kindness, and joy. I maintain boundaries that remind me and others of my needs and my desire to be well. I show up with my very best as a daughter, lover, auntie, neighbor, and friend. I hold tight to my belief in, in revolution. Justice is not a passive pursuit, but one braided into every way I show up in the world. 
I name my privileges, being educated, financially secure, neurotypical, able-bodied, and cisgendered, and I use them as platforms to fight for the well-being of others. It is an honor to learn my way through this lifetime. I commit myself to my curiosity and interests, gaining new and deeper knowledge not only of myself, but also of my unique interests like art or the history of Black feminism. They're always a worthy use of my time. I have found my work in the world to be rooted in using my genius as an activist, writer, entrepreneur, and philanthropic innovator. I do my work in a way that aligns with my values and desires. Rest is a right I hold as a human being. Knowing that my best self is my highest service, I tend generously to my rest and healing, mind, body, and soul. I give myself permission to let go of perfectionism and invest energy into simply being inspired by the living. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank wow. you. It's so beautiful. And I want all of you to know um, that <laughs> it's all true. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know Rachel personally, and it's all true, and it remains true. And no matter how much you change, and you do change, and you're constantly transforming. I mean, all of us are, but you do it at a highly accelerated <laughs> rate. Um, and that I think sometimes it makes you even feel like you have a little bit of whiplash. But like you, you are still and always these things, and still and always mm -hmm. will be these things. And and I also want the reader to know that the generosity of this book is that this is not only you telling your own story, it's also you teaching us how to write a manifesto of our own. Mm -hmm. and, and if you read along in this book, Rachel takes every line of that manifesto throughout the book and she gives you the opportunity to fill in your own answers to it. Who are you? What matters to you? Like, what are your privileges? What are your highest values? So that by the time you finish this book, you can know just as much who you are as as Rachel knows who she is and 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 you don't do it by imitating Rachel you do mm -hmm. it by finding your own truth which is what I find so moving about this um after I wrote Eat Pray Love and a lot of people were imitating that trip I used mm -hmm. to say to which I don't mind at all it's like go 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 do all those things eat the pizza go to Italy go to <laughs> India you know do it do it all but I would say to people don't do what I did ask what I asked Yes. Um, and you will find your own journey. And so I want to know what are the questions that you have asked in your life that has that have brought you to this place of such deep self trust and self knowing, even through all the upheavals and the transformations. I love that you said that because I have I'm having the same exact experience and I'm so proud of the people who are coming to me saying that they ask themselves new questions like questions that aren't even in the book that they're you know at the, the point is to give people an opportunity a permission slip a nudge to ask themselves questions um, but I think some of the biggest questions I continue to ask myself to give me calibration towards you know um, understanding my myself is right now a lot of it is how is my body showing up in this space while my mother was passing away i was having like wild stomach pains like wild wild stomach pains and um as much as i was really burdened by it i was really in awe of how my body was also having this experience and it really has brought me into a deeper relationship with my actual body and so a lot of my questions lately have been asking my body like how are you feeling where is this coming from what does this mean and giving myself permission to like sit in it sit in my body be in my body be in relationship with it that's definitely one of it another one is looking at like the negative space of life like what don't i want i think often we are so worried about figuring out what we do want when sometimes the easier access into discovery might be recognizing what you don't want and in my book i talk about you know my sister's addiction i talk about um growing up in poverty and kind of recognizing it pretty early that there was something going on that had to do with race that was making other you know i, I write about how i would go to my soccer coach's house and be like how do you have all of this because in my mind I'm like they're not smarter than my mom they're not kinder than my mom like so all the things that you're telling me give you a good life are don't seem they don't seem to be playing by the same rules and so I started questioning kind of the negative space like what what don't I want um 
And I think the last thing that continues, that has been and continues to be a conversation for me is, um, you know, asking who benefits from the way that I decide to move. And unless mm, I am wow. one of the people who benefit from it, <laughs> then I'm probably not going to participate in it. So, you know, big changes, like even my divorce, like who benefits from me staying married? The only people who benefit really is the old men who wrote the Bible and decided what the rules were for how women were to engage in marital affairs. And it was to not get divorced no matter what. And, you know, the people who did benefit from it is me getting, you know, feeling my space of liberation, my ex-husband getting the opportunity to find someone who actually would be ready and willing to be there with him in that way. Um, mm -hmm. And and I continue to, you know, I was so nervous getting the divorce. I was like, oh my gosh, everyone's going to care. People are going to talk about this. It's going to be on the nightly news. It's going you know, like to be in the church news. Breaking news. Breaking news. <laughs> it feels like that when you're making Ohio Christian house. Christian house. <laughs> <laughs> is also interested in women. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Not so sure about news. news, even with women. Breaking news. This just in. <laughs> yes. It feels like that. When it feels like this big decision is going to affect all these other people. And I and I learned one thing. I'm happy I learned in that moment is that people are going to care for a solid three weeks, maybe. And then everyone's going to go about their lives. Yeah. Think about the gossip you love to have. You're really not thinking about it again the next day. You've moved on. And so um, remember, like, who benefits and who really cares? <laughs> like, no one cares. <laughs> I might as well make the decisions that make sense for me because no one's really thinking about, no one's thinking about you as much as you're thinking about you. <laughs> I think about you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, there was a moment where everyone was thinking about you a lot. Like, I That's just want to say, you know, like, generally, That's true. I was basing, generally, I was totally basing that off of my days when no one had any idea who I was. That's there was a changed. little bit of yeah, there is a little bit of space, but even now still, I say there's a news cycle, there's a, you know, pe there's more interesting people out on the internet than well, me. Well, out <laughs> outrage, I've discovered that outrage can only last, people can only sustain, I mean, people, the internet is outraged all the mm -hmm. time, but um, people don't have the attention span to remain outraged yeah. Yeah. Um, for more than a couple yeah. of days. <laughs> yeah, very true. Um, and, then, yeah. and then, and then there's a new outrage. Then there's a new thing to be outraged. There's a new outrage. So it's like, well, now their attention, now we're going to be outraged about this. So yeah. they, they, yeah. they just wait it out. Yeah. Um, but I do want to talk about the moment when everyone was looking at you, including me, um, and was looking at you with hungry eyes. Um, so you, uh, for those of you who don't know, Rachel came into the public eye, um, and you had your own very interesting journey before 2017. But you, you were at the Women's March in Washington, and there was a photo of you with um, a white feminist friend of yours that. They kind of captured this utopian, um, mm -hmm. intersectional feminist movement ideal that we were all mm -hmm. like, like the kumbaya moment that, <laughs> that a lot of us were, um, were dreaming of, um, holding signs uh, in the nation's capital. And, it, and the, the photo went viral because it made everybody feel good, but it didn't make everybody feel good. Um, and you were, you were called out. Um, you were personally challenged by, by black feminists and by black intellectuals and by the black press about like, Hey, do you know the actual reality of mm -hmm. of white feminism and its relationship to black women? To which you, in your very typical Rachel Cargill way, were like, "No, in fact, I don't. Let me go now and learn about this, and now let me um, take this moment where I'm in center stage and teach everybody mm -hmm. about it, including me." Um, you describe yourself in the book as being, for many white women, their first teacher on what was so flawed and dangerous and wrong about white feminism. And you know, I remember bef long before I knew you wanting you to be that for me mm. you know um probably in the same way that your husband wanted you mm. to be his good christian ohio mm -hmm. housewife mm -hmm. um probably in the way that columbia mm -hmm. when you went to the, your to get your ivy league education wanted you to be the symbol mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. their you know expansiveness to mm -hmm. black women in higher education i mean we could go down the list of your life of all these things that people wanted you to be um, and yet, time and again, you have gracefully refused <laughs> um, to, to stay in one role. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd love it if you could talk about, because all of us are always transitioning, but transition is painful, it's frightening, it's mm -hmm. expensive, it's inconvenient, um, and, you know, it's scary. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I want you to talk, if you could especially talk about the role that a lot of the people on this in this room right now watching this 
um, will be like me, white left-leaning feminist women who really wanted you to be our great teacher. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember the moments when I started to see you pulling away from that and saying things like, I'm going to rest. I'm going to be offline. I'm going to, I'm going to go to Jamaica. I'm going to, I don't need to do this for all of you. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, if you could speak to that, I think it, it would be, uh, I think it's really important. Yeah. I think that once the photo went viral and I, and I was literally learning out loud, I was getting criticism from the black community saying, Hey, there's some things you need to know me mm -hmm. stepping away saying, Oh my gosh, there is so much I need to know. And I felt very anxious because, you know, what really fueled me to even to even be learning quote unquote out loud is that I would realize I was part of many white women feminist organizations that had mostly white women, including, you know, I was on the Young Professionals Board of the Miss Foundation. I was, I grew up in all white spaces. I posted a, a, a photo in my story today. I, I'm back home, so I was looking through some photos and it's me on an all white boys soccer team. I, I must've begged my mom to let me play with the boys. And so I'm on this all, like I, I've been been surrounded by whiteness in so many ways for so much of my life and when I was learning these realities about the harm that was caused to um, black women throughout the history of the feminist movement I actually had like a physical reaction saying wow I'm surrounded by them so I either need to like let them know about themselves in the ways that I like if I didn't know it I know they don't know it <laughs> like if I if I hadn't gotten this information and taken it to heart I know that they weren't out searching for the ways white women might have been you know yeah. uh, um, showing up in feminist spaces and so um, it was really me right recognizing that I already was, I already had many white friends and I was surrounded and I was in many white spaces. And so the least I could do was work with what I understood is my little platform, which at the time I probably had 3000 followers. And I was like, okay, let me just share what I'm learning. Like, Hey, I read this book. Hey, here are these facts I learned. And there, be, there came more and more people um, who wanted to, and who were willing to sit and hear about these specific things that were happening. So it really was another moment where I was asking myself questions and inviting other people to ask themselves the same questions. And I, as I continued to learn, as I continued to gather information, as I continued to sit under my teach, all, the many, many people in the world who are my teachers, um, I started to recognize a few things. One, it was my first time really writing publicly. And so I don't have any degrees. So it's not like I had really studied this particular craft of writing, but I, I kind of got to a space where I was like, oh, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. I'm okay. I'm okay enough at this that people are able to read through it and get some information. And so I started to really, um, find ways for me to use whatever quote unquote natural talent I had to pour to pour into this work. But as I continued to pour into it, I was like, wait, do I want to use this thing that I've discovered about me just to talk about race? Like white people get to, to write about romance. White people get to write about eat, pray, love uh, and going out and exploring the world. And white people get to, you know, they get to make children's books where all the characters are puppies and they don't have to make any consideration or have any thought about, um, you know, representation. And so I was having conversations with my friend Ebony Janice, who first invited me into this consideration of what else would you be doing with your time, your skills, your talent, your energy, if you weren't just fighting racism, fighting for survival. And that was one of the first times I decided, I started to consider that either I need to do something different or I needed to step away and shape shift this work. And that's when I really started to pour into my highest values. Like, okay, what are my values? I want, I know I want to focus and center black women. I know I want to focus and center in this space of academia and literary work. Um, and I know I want to be able to remain authentic in my work. I, I was not interested in entering a space to be a guru to where I had to like keep up to the standard that people were expecting. And I also didn't want to only be valuable if I was talking about surviving 
racism. And so I really started to allow myself to, ex to expand into other spaces. And so I started writing about art and I started to, um, you know, look for, you know, I started the foundation where I was able to support uh, black women and it wasn't, my work wasn't being a fight against whiteness. It was being a cultivation of black joy. I, I really started to reimagine what it meant to do my work in a way that didn't weather my nervous system in the way that educating on social media began became um and it also just offered me a more sustainable and more expansive opportunity to live my work and i i'm so grateful for the ways you know i my work still very much centers black women it doesn't look the way that it looked online in 2020 but it also um you know it it invites me to be curious um and i really and i really love that continued opportunity to say here are my values what other way can i express it here here here's the work that i do in the world what other shape can this take and i'm grateful for my readers who follow me through all of these spaces of my life who say rachel i hear you talking about race how can we get curious with you i hear you talking about grief how can we get curious with you and i hope um that my my readers continue to join me in this like in our collective journey of the living, of the expanding, of the discovery. I'm, I feel so grateful. Um, oh, no one's going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> We're all joining you. Don't worry. We're going to go like on whatever journey you end up going on. Um, one of the things I admire about this journey is that you, you, you sold a book. Um, and I, and I want to talk about the book business. And I also want to talk about the writing business. So many people who will watch this interview um want to write books so i always on the onward book club always talk about the process yeah. of writing mm -hmm. and and one of the things that i that i that i want you to speak to is the pivot that you made internally mm -hmm. between so for many people the dream of dreams is that you're going to get a book deal by um by a publishing company who who like believes in you mm -hmm. and then you present your idea and they're like here here's your book advance mm -hmm. um we're going to publish your book and then somewhere in that process you were like, oh, here's the thing, though. I don't want to at all write the book that, that you people just gave me money for. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, I want to write a completely different book. Um, and this is the Rachel Cargo moment. You're going to need to give me more money now because in the time since you created this contract, I now have millions of followers. Mm -hmm. So I am more valuable. So instead of going in the position of, somebody begging to be let out of a contract. You even said, oh, I'll happily buy back the contract mm -hmm. my, in order mm -hmm. to be free to write what I want, mm -hmm. as Kiesi has done. Um, but it's, but instead they were like, like, oh, we'll give you more money mm -hmm. and you should write the book that you want to mm -hmm. write. So I, it's, but I, I just want to, I, I want to talk about the change that you made from the book that you were initially going to write to the book that we now are yeah. discussing tonight, yes. um, including this amazing title and cover. And, and also, the, the extraordinary self-possession that I have never seen you without mm -hmm. um, of being able to walk into a room and say, here's what's going to happen now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, here's what's going to happen now. I'm more valuable now. I was mm -hmm. always valuable, but I'm even mm -hmm. more valuable now. And mm -hmm. I want that value to be recognized yes. financially, even though I'm writing a totally different book mm -hmm. than the one you bought. It's so magnificent what you did. And, and it's, it's not what people typically do. So mm -hmm. if you could walk us through yeah. how you did that. <laughs> Yes. I think it would be a great service to all of us who are learning how to know our own values. Yes. Even even if I, we are changing. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. I wanna I wanna speak critically to the language of value. Yeah. Because I think I think what I recognize and what I'm what I'm really working through myself right now around value, like where do I hold value and where have I always valued myself? But in these industries, um, their value is purely algorithmic. <laughs> like yeah. they, they're, they're, they're how they see you as valuable often is purely related to their marketing numbers and, and also related to their, um, their expectation of sales. It's not like, oh, I think you're a great writer and you deserve this. It, it rarely is about that. And so I think that when I first signed the book in 2000, in 2018, um, when I first signed the book deal, they were seeing me as this like up and coming um, anti racism educator, and they wanted to catch that wave with me. They wanted to, um, and I and I I I speak often about how I 
feel a bit taken advantage of even now from those original um, agents and publishers who um, I think they were like, oh, she is on the rise. And so let's like grab this without actually um, considering value or even what my actual needs were as an author. Right. Um, and you know the publishing world is like Oz, like you go behind the curtain no one you don't know until you until you know <laughs> and so there were a lot of things that i was learning and so they had signed me to write an anti-racism book um that was originally going to be called i do not want your love and light and I it was love that title i know <laughs> it's very, I know it's very <laughs> different i remember you telling me about it at the time and i was like oh that's very good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um very, and very so good. Yeah, I was working on this and it, it was going to be, you know, a bit of a culmination of my work. I did online some additional research. And so I signed in 2018. I was really, you know, working, working as an educator, working online with social media and trying to write this book. And by time 2020 came, I was absolutely depleted because we were going so hard after the murder of George Floyd. There was so much there was so much actual like physical marching. There was so much rallying. Yeah. But then there's a lot of uh, a lot in the space that I was occupying, which was online educating and a lot of other like organizational educating spaces. And I was just exhausted and I didn't feel like my editor was understanding what I was trying to do with my work. And that was one of the big times where I said, who benefits from this? <laughs> like I, if I am going to be a little worm under a rock by the time this book is out, it's, it's not worth it for me. And so I did go to my team and I did say, I'm willing to pull the contract um, because this isn't what I want to do. This isn't how I want want to do it um, and things had changed and so um, I think that also was a, a bit of me like being able to honor change like something's different so something has to be different and and there's 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 a uh, I want to give myself grace for those moments and so I clearly expected everyone else to give me grace as well and so I went to I went to uh, to the publishers and I said, you know, I don't want to write an anti-racism book. I There's no way I'm going to spend another few years of my life trying to get this onto the page in the way that you all wanted and expected because it's just not coming out of me. And I said, but I do think I can do the same type of work through a memoir and through a manifesto. And so I knew the the um, shape would fit me better. The storytelling would fit me better. And it just what would it is what I knew would benefit my readers and I knew it would benefit me. And um, the, you know, I was able to also get the publisher to say, yes, we understand where you're going with this and to go along as well. And um, I did make the, I, I did, I, you know, I know the, if you have to know the playing field you're on, you have to know the playing field you're on. So I recognize that that with the number of the, with the higher number of followers I had, I had leverage that I had a voice not only because of what I call my platform privilege, but also because, um, you know, I know that they, I, I they I knew that they were wanting to say that they got my book, that they were the ones who got this anti-racism sure. education, like you said, to yeah. be able to say that. And so I leveraged that in the same way that they leverage everything against everyone else. And so I really kind of studied the playing field and I said, okay, what is here? What opportunities do I have? And I took them. And I think that, um, you know, the book deal that I got isn't isn't a normal book deal that people would get, but it is something that I, it is a story that I can tell to encourage people to push the boundaries in these um, industries that aren't there to serve us, to remember that there is an algorithm that you can play into and say like, okay, actually, I know your formula and this is how I fit into it. And this is where I have, where I hold value for you. And also to remember our own understanding of value to ourselves, that I'm worth my mental health, I'm worth my capacity. I'm worth the time this is taking. I'm worth, um, you know, I'm worth getting away from the stress that the original book was giving me. And, you know, it's really, it's really, that, that was just another muscle building moment in the same way of my marriage. Like, yes, this marriage is wonderful, but I think that I can, I think that I deserve something that feels right. And being able to move from that, like this ongoing understanding that I have the right to know what's best for me. Um, yeah, and that's that's how it showed up in the book world. <laughs> um, it's. I want to see if I can express this. <laughs> Something that I admire about you is, I think nimble is the word that I would <laughs> use um, to describe the way that you are doing two things at the same time and both. And, and tell me if I'm wrong anywhere here, but this is the sense that I have. 
um, you're doing two things at the same time, both very nimbly. And one of them is that you're learning how to play in a playing field that is built on, as you write in the book, a value system shaped by whiteness, capitalism, misogyny, and scarcity, right? Mm -hmm. This is the reality of the world in what, into which you were born. Mm -hmm. And very nimbly, you have learned to operate within that world and to succeed within that world. Um, despite that, and to learn, it's almost like jujitsu, like to learn as you, mm -hmm. like the story that you just mm -hmm. cho told is like, oh, if you're going to leverage me mm -hmm. and use me, and I know how this game mm -hmm. works, now watch me do this right mm -hmm. back at you. And mm -hmm. now who now like and we're both yes. we're all six yes. and we're the selling books and I you know yeah. And the difference is my friend Sonia Renee Taylor speaks to uh, you know, money is neutral. Money, it's, it's kind of like water. Like if you freeze it, and you could hit someone over the head and kill them, but it's also the thing that will keep us alive. It could be the the best thing. I call like it tofu. tofu. Yes. It takes on the flavor of whatever yes. your energy yes. is that you're putting yes. out. <laughs> yes, I feel that way. Protein, yeah. yeah, it takes on the flavor. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and one thing that is true, one thing that, that I know about me is that when I make money, it's going to go towards the things that matter to me. It's going to go towards the foundation. It's going to pour into the bookstore. It's going to pour into, you know, the goodness that I have in these spaces. What right. these white billionaire men do, what these white billionaire women do, what regular, you know, you know, normal everyday people do with their money is, is none of my business or concern. Um, unless I'm fight, but I will fight and go into, I will get on the playing field and I'll play and I'll bring it back in the way that um in the way that i can and so um yeah i i think thank you for for that reflection but i also have to say that's what i'll, I'll speak to black this that's what black people have to do right. you 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 go on to a field where the rules change based on who's in office and most of the times the rules are always changing to the benefit of whiteness um you you move into different space you have to code switch you have to you know shape shift in order to that's what's expected of you and so i i don't think it's a virtue of mine that i'm able to be nimble i think i'm a black girl who who grew up in a white space and recognized that there were some things that i was going to have to learn if i was yeah. going to be well and that's what i did and it showed up in my youth and it's showing up in my adulthood yeah and you're and the other piece of it is that and I mean, that's extraordinary enough. Like if that's all you were doing, <laughs> that would be amazing. But the other thing you're doing is you're also changing culture at the same time. So I guess what, what I find sort of dazzling about you is that you're, you're doing all of that within the culture as it is. And then the things that you're creating are, you're creating different culture within them, which mm -hmm. is all about the reimagining in the book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you, you talk about the Loveland Foundation mm -hmm. and the Loveland, the umbrella mm -hmm. of this, this entity that you created. Um, and and dreaming a new way of thinking about being an entrepreneur and being a mm -hmm. philanthropist and being a CEO and and creating a company. And you write about Loveland Group as a matriarchal company, um, meaning that rather than using the values of hierarchy and concentration of power, the values and practices of the company are dictated by the people doing the work. You say Loveland operates with a moral compass that calibrates us away from the capitalist do more, make more, acquire more mantras and that it's goal oriented rather than bottom line oriented. So you're, but you're also succeeding at capitalism. <laughs> um, and, but at the same time, um, using the other half of you um, to, to reinvent any sphere that you enter into and to reimagine it. And I wondered if you could speak about what that looks like um, for many of us who have only ever been in systems that are, mm -hmm. that are dictated by do more, make more, acquire more. How, mm -hmm. Tell us about Loveland, first of all, um, for yeah. those of us those who don't know what it is, and, and then tell us how it is, you know, like what its essence is and how it, how it is different from the world at large and what it's doing. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's a it's a hard place to exist in when you know facts and information in the world. <laughs> like when you know any type of information, you're like, oh my gosh, this is wild. This this space is wild. My understanding of the world is wild. And so, um, you know, I I really studied a lot. Um, in the book, I talk about after my divorce, I went in and um, I was like, oh, okay. Well, now that I don't have a husband to make 
to you know care for me financially how am i going to make money i had never really made money before i never really had paid a ton i maybe had paid my cell phone bill but my you know i was in college and then my husband took care of everything and so um i was really in a space of like deep curiosity and excitement about how like what i could do to to uh, make a living for myself and what excited me most about entrepreneurship is that i got to choose who i worked with and I knew that I would want to work with women. So I was really excited that I'd get to pay women. I got, I'd get to pay a lot of women. And how this all started was that I was a babysitter in Washington, D.C. I lived after my divorce. I went to D.C. to see what who I might be in the world. And I was babysitting. And um, at the end of the year, and I loved, I, I even loved the, uh, just this space of curiosity within babysitting. Like I was also working as an admin at a taxi company. So I would use their computer and I would make little notes with the child's name at the top and I would print them out on the printer and then I would leave it for the parent. I would send them a post babysitting text and say like, I hope it was well. I hope you can leave me a review on the app. Like I really love saying like, how good can this tiny thing of babysitting get and by the end of my first year doing that i had so many babysitting clients that i had used that i was like oh i can't even i was writing i remember i was writing them uh Christmas cards, like end of the year, thank you for letting me be a part of your family this year. That was my own little entrepreneur marketing plan as an individual babysitter. <laughs> so I, was, I was so intrigued by like customer service. Company and, letterhead. Yes. Of, just like from the desk. I, of Rachel and oh my gosh. Literally, and I had <laughs> ordered one. I could only, I ordered one shirt that said like babysitter. I would go to the dollar store and get a bag, like just a little cheap canvas bag and get, you know, nine toys for $9 that I could afford. And I would bring that with me everywhere. I just loved, um, the space of creativity and business and the fact that I get to serve people who I care about, learn from people. I was, I, I was able to work in the homes of women who I would look at their bookshelves and I would say, oh my gosh, this looks amazing. Can I have this book? And they'd say yes. And women who I'd be like, I see you're speaking on stage at this conference. If you have any extra tickets, I'd love to be able to come. And I would really use that also as an opportunity mm -hmm. to discover what I liked about myself and what, you know, I still have the vacuum cleaner that one woman used to use in her home that I was like, wow, this is a nice vacuum cleaner. <laughs> so I was like, as soon as I have any type of money, I'm buying this vacuum cleaner. What kind of vacuum cleaner? It was is the it? little no. floor. Uh, is it the is meal? It and, uh, yes, the yes. meal. I was like, I thought that was yes, a meal. It was, it yes. was, <laughs> yeah. And, and I was like, first time this I met is, one of those vacuum yes. cleaners. I was like, someday I will have one day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one day. So I love the opportunity to explore and discover and understand yes. myself through this work. So anyways, all of that to say, I, I entered into entrepreneurship with like a curiosity and an expansiveness for what it could be. I had so many families. I then started to tell my friends like, hey, if you want some babysitting time, I have some families who you might be able to make money from. So I was just, I was really intrigued by the opportunity. Um, that I could give for my friends by being an entrepreneur. And so I was studying, at that time, I was studying a lot of Oprah, I was studying a lot of Beyonce. And what I loved about Oprah was that she just does whatever she wants. Oprah wakes up in the morning right. and she says, I want a pizza, I also want a school, I also want a book club, I also want, you know, like she just, she, she has created a space where she's like, Mm, what do I want to do today? I'm going to interview people in my backyard. Like she just literally is in all of these spaces. And so I said, the type of life that I want to live, I wanted to have that type of freedom. And so uh, Harpo, uh, which is Oprah backwards, I, I, I was like, I'm finding all of these little egg, you know, Easter eggs about her company. It's an umbrella company. And I was like, oh, so she has an umbrella company called Harpo. And then she starts all these other companies under it, depending on what she wants to do. I was like, okay, cool. I want to do that. And so I sketched that out. I jump that up and I kind of say it's like when you have a car when you when you really want a yellow car and you see it all over the place I really wanted to build out something like this and I started to see the people who would fit into it all over the place and um I ended up building out the Loveland group. Um, and as business ideas came to mind, I would bring my team together and, you know, we would have these dream sessions about what it could be, who it could serve, how we could collaborate. And um, as it continues, you know, the, the company continues to change shape and the company continues to shift. But what remains is that type of matriarchal intention, that type of um, creative and service oriented approach, and the type of fun and creativity that can come when you're really coming into business. Um, with a bit of uh, like delightful expectation. <laughs>
<laughs> delightful expectation. If your middle name wasn't Elizabeth, should be your middle name. <laughs> <laughs> delightful expectation. Gargle. <laughs> you know, and that's like I have a question about. I mean, I guess we can't know this because nobody knows what creates a person's spirit. Mm -hmm. But you have such. Um, it, it seems like a preternaturally extraordinary enthusiastic spirit, um, mm -hmm. and. And I've heard you credit that and also tremendous independence and a tremendous sense of um, like, well, that wasn't there before, so I'm going to go make it. I'm going to go mm -hmm. do it. And I've heard you um, talk about, well, I had to do that, you know, because mm -hmm. um, I grew up with a mother who was disabled. Your mother had polio. Mm -hmm. And by the time you came around, she was she was quite mm -hmm. disabled. And so there was a lot of adult responsibility. You said you were often mm -hmm. sometimes the only educated person in the room. You were sometimes the only um, mobile mm -hmm. person in the room who was able, you know, there were things that you had to do from a very young age. Um, and your mother was much older when she had you, um, in addition to everything that you have to do to survive mm -hmm. as a black girl in a white culture. Um, and, and you said, you said once in an interview that you felt that you had been sort of shaped and forged by trauma and that trauma had mm -hmm. made you among other things, just incredibly competent. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not always the story of what trauma does mm -hmm. to people, right? Like, uh, you know, we always say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but we also can look around at people yeah. in our lives and we can see, in some cases, what doesn't kill you makes you super fucked up. Yes. You know, yes. like, we'll um, kill like, you slowly. What doesn't we'll kill, kill you immediately will kill you slowly. We'll kill you slowly. And yes. make you totally incapable mm -hmm. of of mm -hmm. life, you know, um, and, make, and make you the opposite of independent, mm -hmm. make you, you know, p your story. It's interesting, whenever I hear you tell your story, I always think, boy, this story could be told very differently. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you had a different nature, the story could be, I can't do anything because I was, you know, because the, we were raised in financial straits and because my older sister, my sisters were addicts mm -hmm. and because my father wasn't there and mm -hmm. because my mom, um, and, and yet he, you, you alchemize mm -hmm. um, everything that happens to you into, you somehow alchemize, eventually you get there even if you're in, in grief and trauma i've seen you alchemize things even in a, a divorce like i went through a divorce and it was the most traumatizing thing that ever happened to me mm -hmm. you went through a divorce and you were like i feel so possible <laughs> <laughs> and i was like i feel so guilty and our stories were the same mm -hmm. we both left our husbands because we mm -hmm. were like there's got to be something more than this mm -hmm. you know i went like to the edge of suicide because i felt so mm -hmm. ashamed of myself mm -hmm. for it you were like it's going to be great for him too <laughs> You seem to have this extraordinary capacity mm -hmm. to take things that in, in, in other people's psyches could be so destroying mm -hmm. um, and, and somehow you make it like you double down on it being affirming, exuberant, joyous. Like, and I wonder if you think that you came out that way, mm -hmm. like, is this your natural like software program? Or, or do you think you were forged that way? And of course, like I said, we, yeah. we don't know, but I'm curious to know what you think about why you are mm -hmm. the way you are. <laughs> I'm so excited and to I talk about it. Bottle it. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, I'm so excited to talk about this because I've really been exploring it myself, like in, in my own therapy and in, in, a, in a lot of spaces. So I'll speak to two things. One, I think that that early on in life, I had to decide that I was either going to choose optimism or I was going to drown. Like it had, to, it, mm. at least until I got to adulthood, I, rec I recognized in my childhood, if I was going to let that kill me, then I would never get to know what adulthood could look like. And I think that part of it, I, I will always go back to curiosity because in my younger life, I knew I was looking around and saying, oh, there's other ways to live. Oh, there's other ways to live. So I didn't feel hopeless in this one because I knew that there was something else out there that I could choose once I had the autonomy to choose it. And I, you know, I asked often for the things that I needed to my mother, but I got that from my mother who as a disabled woman, she always had to ask for help, you know, her in a wheelchair and me three years old, I remember going to the grocery store and coming out and we had tons of groceries and I couldn't put it in the trunk. She couldn't put it in the trunk. So I have 
many Sundays of my life where I remember my mom asking any random person who walked by, hey, can you throw these in our trunk for us? And she, she didn't even necessarily say it kindly. She was like, can, she was like, hey, do this real quick before you head into the store. <laughs> like it was never, she never felt guilty. Like, can you please, I, I never saw my mom, I never in my life have seen my mother beg for anything that she needs. She, I, I've actually been embarrassed by how straightforward she said it because I'm like, there has to be another step of like sandwiching it but my mother like i i grew up assuming that people were going to help because of the way that my mother moved through the world so i learned that lesson and i learned that you know i, I played i i tell the story about me playing soccer when i was younger and the fields were always wet in the mornings when we would play and so my mother petitioned to the city because her crutches would get stuck and she would end up sitting in the car and watching my game from the parking lot she petitioned the city that we lived in to build a sidewalk from the parking lot to the field just so she could see me play that gives a massive space of like wow she deserved she felt she deserved infrastructure she she felt she deserved concrete being poured there's people who don't even feel they deserve to ask the waiter to change the thing that they told them to do my mother <laughs> felt like they needed to pour concrete so she, she could have deserved a, infrastructure yes she yeah. deserved infrastructure. never mind i'll eat the fish i ordered the chicken i it's know okay. it's fine I don't need i'm allergic to this thing there doesn't need to be a sidewalk yeah <laughs> yes and so i think i learned a lot of i, I think that also yeah. instilled a hope a hope in me yeah. um that i think is a part of the the um sometimes i think the definition of hope is just like sustained curiosity of like oh okay what else could be what else could be what else could be so i think i did have a lifetime of that but i will say i used to get made fun of when i was little sometimes people would be like you're so ditzy because you're so happy all the time people used to say that to me often i remember in college a, a man i was dating said to me you are the happiest black girl i've ever met and i didn't take it as a compliment i was like what does that mean i'm like just because black girls aren't like smiling in your face all the time doesn't mean that they're not happy and so i it's always mm -hmm. been something in in myself but i will say that as i'm going through my own therapy i'm learning that i often uh let's take the example of my divorce a survival mechanism that many of us have and if there's anyone like me who has had this like intensive perhaps optimism it is a it's really a trauma response mm -hmm. that we create mm -hmm. narratives in our mind to hold on to to get us through to the next moment that we hope will be better so what i'm really working on now is that how can i look at a at a thing more critically and say what is the thing perhaps admit to the things that are hard and are horrible but still be able to hold myself together to move through the next moment so i think that's a continued part of my healing but i'm grateful for this tool that has helped me continue to move through but I think the the aside from the narrative creating around myself as a tool I think also the hope and the joy is something that I'll continue to hold and craft and curate that sustained that sustained curiosity for what else is possible from one moment to the next I I want to share I hope it's okay with you but I I learned firsthand watching you we did an event um, in at the Kripalu Center yes. <laughs> um, that was so great um, and it was such a celebration because you were like, I want to do a creativity workshop. I don't want to just do a race workshop. Yes. Like, let's do it, you know. And we did this beautiful, and, and it was very transformative for me. Mm -hmm. I told you that the, mm -hmm. the segment of the workshop that you taught uh, literally changed my mm -hmm. life. Um, like mm -hmm. there were things you taught that day that were that blew my mind and and transformed the way that I live. Um, one of which I'm going to share with everybody because mm -hmm. it, it's so mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked us what we do about difficult people in our lives. And I like choked and struggled through some, <laughs> some answer. I don't remember what I said. And then you said, you don't have any difficult people in your life um, and that you treat yourself to that. Um, and that if people are difficult in your life, then they don't get to be in your life. And, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, and I and the 400 people in the room were like, wait, 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 what? Like you can, this is often an experience I have with you, which is like, wait, you can do that? Like you can do that you can say oh no my life is too short and precious and i'm and and no and um and somebody in the audience said but what about really difficult family members who who have to be in your life and um and you said i'm thinking as hard as i can and i can't think of anybody who's entitled to be in my life it was one of the most important things i've ever heard anybody say i'm thinking as hard as i can can't come up with it. I can't think of anybody who is entitled to be in my life. Um, I, I, it 
was, I've never heard anybody say that mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. All I've heard is strategies that mm-hmm. people create to try to handle the people who they feel are entitled to be in their mm-hmm. lives um, mm-hmm. rather than being like, oh, no, nobody's entitled to mm-hmm. be in their life. Um, where did you learn that? And it, because mm-hmm. it's, it, I mean, I felt it move through the room in a wave of like awakening that, that mm-hmm. I also experienced in that mm-hmm. moment. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to speak to that. But Liz, I told you we're not doing Q&A, but some of the live people have questions. So I'm just telling you, we got to do some of them. Great. Okay. Yeah, listen. <laughs> Listen, but to I'll answer, stay on the phone as long as you want to. <laughs> I'll sleep over at this point. Um, but I think to speak to that, you know, it, it really started with my relationship with my sisters and in the ways that they had really hurt me. And for for the many years that I had been a bit excommunicated from them because of the ways that they hurt me, the ways that I was upset at the way that they might have hurt my mother or my nieces and nephews. And I was going through... All, I, most of my therapy in my life has been talking about my sisters. It was something that I was constantly finding strategies to get, to get through. And I was just like, who do I owe this to? Like, who do I owe this to? Who, who benefits from this? Who benefits from this rule that if you are born by the same person, you have to take shit forever? Like, who made up this rule? Who made up this rule that if you are in the family with someone, then you have the responsibility to, uh, you know, bear down and take take pain and affliction. And we're we're obviously not talking about like just some difference, you know, difference in opinion yeah. or we're talking about you know, it. Yeah. yeah, we're we're Actual talking about toxicity. Yes. We're yeah. talking about like deep toxicity that that really harms you emotionally yeah. or uh, or physically. Um, you know, the, the space that physical abuse comes into play. And so I I had to make a decision that like and, and also kind of with my husband too like just because you're a wonderful person and I and I really adore him and not that I wanted him out of my life but I didn't have to transform myself to make room for the need for for the needs or desires of other people and if those needs and desires were harming me or people I cared about then I'm giving my permission I'm giving myself permission to step away um from from that space and so I think it 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 was me another survival technique of like I have to give myself the grace to to not constantly be harmed by these people because i used to say i i i often tell people like i wouldn't even be friends with my sisters there was a time where i'm like you aren't even the t- i would never let anyone talk to me the way you talk to me why am i letting you talk to me this way is it because we have the same mom like that's not enough evidence for me for why i should continuously let this harm happen to me especially if it's pulling me away from the good i want to do in the world from the people that do love me in the world from the people who love me in the way that i need to be loved and so it really it really was questioning who made up this rule what is this rule that says that just because you were born of the same family you now have to hunker down and take shit forever yeah Mm -hmm. um who made up this rule would also be a very good title for this book. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, I want to get to the question mm-hmm. that the, that yes, the person yes, yes. in the live audience at, at your bookstore um, said, but I, 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 I do want to say to people, again, encouraging you to read this book, um, there's nothing you don't ask that question about. Mm-hmm. Who made up this rule? Um, who made up these rules about religion? Who made up these rules about monogamy? Mm-hmm. Who made up these rules about how many lovers you can have? Mm-hmm. Um, like you're very, you're very open about just like, oh no, I, um, I decided, I love this line you wrote, page 70, I decided that I want to fall in love as many times as I please in this lifetime. Such a radical thing to say like who made up the rule that you're not allowed to say that um who made up the rule about how you work within capitalism Mm -hmm. you know all all of these who made up the rule about you need to have a higher education and a degree in order to be an academic who's admired Mm -hmm. by by people like all of it you're just Mm -hmm. um and i'm wondering before we get to the 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 reader's question are there any rules right now because i read this book and i'm like like, I think she covered them all, but like, are there any rules right now that you're looking at? Um, yeah. Or that have come up in you where you're like, wait a minute, I, I think I'm following a rule that doesn't yes. apply to me anymore. And, and what might that be? I have some good ones that are really on my heart that I've been really working through. Um, one of them is, you know, like who made up the rule that we can't, that changing your mind 
means some that has has val there's a value to changing your mind um that you know the only good thing is the good thing is the thing that's forever like that is silly like the only good thing is the thing that goes on and on and on regardless of what's happening regardless of how anyone feels the only time something can be good is if it's sustained and so who made up that rule that's like very odd to me that we can that we literally will hold on to something that might not be good for us for the value of longevity yeah. without really being able to be like this was so good and now that it's not i want you to go find the good that could be with a job that could be in a relationship that could be in a space that could be you know anything like i i i'm interested in my own ability to find the good in the goodness and not in all of these other indicators uh that that i've been given the other thing that might be a little bit related to it is that um i'm and this isn't really a who made up the rule but it's a question you have to ask yourself is that um you don't have to keep up with the joneses even when the joneses are yourself <laughs> like sometimes like why like we, we feel like we have no space to shift because we have to stay at this thing or get better like it's yep. either stay here and climb higher get bigger have more um you know success looks like more to so many people um you know more friends more space more clothes more shoes more square footage more you know whatever the more is and so i am intrigued by the question of uh curation and crafts and specificity that might speak to um more depth than more expansion and so that is one thing like who who made up the rule that uh success only looks like trajectory as opposed to like I, I really view my career as a landscape i i really don't you know i talk about people get on the life escalator and they're like going up in one direction and there's only one ending and the higher you get the harder it is to jump off like there's this life escalator and i really like to view my my life and my career as a landscape like i'm watering this section right now and it's going to grow and it's going to be beautiful and maybe some you know in harvest you got to change the land sometimes you got to put a new type of seed in there and so i'm really leaning into this metaphor and seeing what my life as a landscape looks like as opposed to my life as like this straight road that has to get me from a to b i want to i want to like meander <laughs> well you you have been <laughs> Like, that's and also you. <laughs> the answer to the question who made up the rule that you have to constantly be doing better each quarter yes. um it would be the dutch east indies corporation when they invented <laughs> yes. capitalism and Absolutely. they had a board of directors who needed yep. to be reported to showing that your stocks were increasing mm -hmm. every quarter mm -hmm. and we've in, we've mm -hmm. sort of imbibed that even on a personal level mm -hmm. where like we're looking at a a, a a chart of our lives and it's supposed to look like yes. GE over the last yes. 50 years you know like um, and that's uh, unsustainable for both yeah. humans and mm -hmm. the planet. And mm -hmm. um, it's also incredibly unnatural. Mm -hmm. um, so that's who made up that rule. We don't have to follow that rule anymore. <laughs> so anyway, I want to get to the question that the, 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 okay. the person in the audience asked you. I'm so curious what it is. Yeah, so we have, a, we have maybe two. Great. Two. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do two of them. Um, oh, this was, well, one of them was, what questions are you asking yourself? So I love that. That was already... That was already answered. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it with the questions. <laughs> um, people are asking me what I'm reading. What I'm reading, I'm reading a lot of poetry. I subscribe to like poetry magazine. So I get a new little book of poetry every month and I read it while I'm like doing my coffee and I feel mm. very like very uh it's it's just nice to have like a, a bit like a bit of it's like a bit of yogurt and a bit of poetry is a good morning for me. <laughs> so I loved I I've been enjoying just like night brain soothing poetry um rachel do you have a a particular line of poetry or poet that you return to as a touchstone in your life that you carry with you i don't want to put you on the spot to well, recite a bunch of poetry but i was just wondering if there's something that you I really will say, particularly carry nikki giovanni changed my life mm -hmm. her radical poetry i remember sitting on the bus in new york when i first moved to new york i would just get on a bus and take it to wherever it was going just to explore the city and i remember listening i would listen to nikki giovanni in my headset and i just remember being like near columbus circle and she had a poem about new york city she she talked about like oh i wish i could remember the poem but she talks about like 
the dinosaurs that must have used to live in Central Park. And I was like on the bus passing Central Park. And she just had such a, she, she made me believe that a radical voice was worth having, um, that you could create beautiful art out of radical notions. And, and she really changed, she really did that about me. Um, oh, this is so funny. The question is, is there an inciting incident in your life that influenced your writer voice the most? So I think oh. that one, I think a bit of it was Nikki Giovanni. Yeah. But I also will say there is there is a writer, and I am so sad that I cannot remember her name right now. Her first name is Erin. Um, but I read her book and her words were so, the best word to describe it is that they were flowery. She had such flowery words, but she was saying real important things. And I was like, I want to be flowery and critical at the same time. And so that really influenced me to believe that I don't have to be like yelling or abrasive or, you know, all of these things in my words that that I can write flowery things that speak to things that matter to me. Um, that that really affected me. And I wish I Lauren, I or Aaron, I'm so upset, but I, I'm going to DM her after this to I'm glad that question was asked to remind me of. Um, and then the last question is someone's asking, um, how do both of you manage your fears? Asking mm. both of us. I'd love to hear from you, Liz. Um, I befriended mm. it, um, mm. is, is the main thing. You know, I, I used to fight it, but, but any time, any, I've really discovered that anytime I fight fear, it fights me back and I'm the one who gets pinned <laughs> underneath it. I'm not as strong as it is. And, um, and I, and I speak to it really kindly, um, you know, because it's a frightened spirit being within me. And I ask it a lot of questions like, um, do you know how old I am? Mm -hmm. Like lots of times I'll like, you know, if I'm driving and I'm, and I'm, and I, and you know, my fears come from a very young place with it. They, it's interesting. I feel like they come from a very ancient place because they're, they're like prehistorical. Yeah. Like my, my human body is 200 million years old. My yeah. conscious mind is only 200,000 years old. So, so, you know, the fear reflex is very deep in the body and it's very old. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, it's very ancient. On the other hand, it's very young, meaning intellectually. It's very mm -hmm. young. Um, my fear doesn't understand art. It doesn't understand love. Mm -hmm. It doesn't understand the journey. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't understand. It just knows secure. All it cares about is security mm -hmm. and it sees danger everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's like a popped up security guard in an empty building at night who's had like nine Red Bulls who's shooting at its own shadow, right? Because it's always looking for something to be yeah. frightened of. And so lots of times I'll, when I speak to it, it seems to be a lot when I'm driving because I'll look at my hands. So I'm 54 now. And you know, my hands are starting to, you know, like I'm like age is beginning mm -hmm. to show. So I'll sometimes ask my fear to look at my hands on the mm -hmm. driving wheel and say, can you, do you see how old these, these mm -hmm. hands are? Are you aware that this is a 54 year old woman? Mm -hmm. um, I know it's not 1978. Do you know that it's not 1978? Mm -hmm. You're still trapped in, in the, the beliefs of what you felt when you were eight years old, mm -hmm. but look who's driving an actual, an actual adult woman is yeah. driving. Um, and then I, I speak to it very lovingly and I say a lot of times, especially with fear around creativity, um, I, I just say, I, I, I see you um, mm -hmm. and I love you and, mm -hmm. and you get to exist. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to chase you away. You can be here. I know it's really, I know a lot of the stuff I do is really scary mm -hmm. um, and I know why you're scared. Um, but we're, we're going to do it anyway mm -hmm. and you can come along, you know, but mm -hmm. we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So it's a kindness. It's kind of like the way I try to speak to everybody. Um, mm -hmm. Like, like, yeah, I see you. You, I respect yeah. your right to exist, and I'm going to do this thing anyway. Um, Something so big I'm, happens when you can begin to speak kindly to yourself. That's one yeah. huge shift in the world, and in, in in our inner worlds. And mine is similar. I'm sure I learned it from you. I've been to a few Liz Gilbert workshops, and so <laughs> I I've loved my opportunity to write notes to fear. And one of the things in in both fear and and even in like uh, you know the anxieties that come up, I often try to trace it. Like, oh, this is actually your mom talking. This is this was your mom. You know, my mother didn't travel much, and so uh, and my mother didn't move. She only moved once in the adult life that I've known her, and that's when I moved her out of the apartment that I put her in after you know when I started to make money. And so I get so much anxiety around moving, and I get so much anxiety because I felt I don't know what my mother's fear was that like 
everything was going to be lost in the move. I don't know what it was, but I, I remind myself like, oh, this actually isn't your fear. You've done this a few times and everything was mm -hmm. fine. This is your mother's fear, or this is, this is the church's fear, or this is, you know, your, your five-year-old self's fear. And the, and the funny thing about, um, you know, parenting our younger, reparenting our younger self is that the tools that we're often still using to get through moments were tools developed by like five-year-olds, <laughs> you know, our five-year-old yeah. self. So your five-year-old self would feel like, oh no, this is an awkward situation. I'm going to run. <laughs> like that's a very five-year-old answer to being in an awkward, if, you, if your friend was doing some, something awkward and then you just dart away. And so as an adult, I'm like, oh, this is awkward, but I can't use a five-year-old method to to approach this situation. As an adult, I can lean in and I can say like, wait, what's going on here? And try to figure things out. And so I think remembering and inviting myself to, to consider what the adult tool to this situation is, as opposed to what perhaps the five-year-old or the 13-year-old or even the 20-year-old answer to a situation is, or even a six-month-ago version of me situ uh, answer to a thing is, um, is a good way but i love this because both of our answers speak to self-knowing and i think you know tony k bambara um the black feminist author speaks to the revolution starting with the individual and i also think the renaissance starts with the individual the reimagining starts with the individual if you can't even dream of where you might be next year in joy how can you do that for the the people how can you do that for community and so i think that you know building these tools of inner knowing, inner observation, uh, self-talk. These are some of the kindest, most effective things we can spend our time doing to lead us toward our collective liberation. That's so beautifully put. And uh, I always say, I don't, I don't know anybody who doesn't want to learn how to practice universal human compassion. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to practice universal human compassion and you forget that you're included mm -hmm. in, in the universe, <laughs> The, the universal human compassion that doesn't include you is not mm -hmm. universal, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and so uh, that's something that, that I, yeah. you know, treat yourself with the same kindness and, and care that you, would, that, that you would treat yeah. all the, all the people out there that you're treating with such grace. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel, uh, we're going to, I'm going to let you go only because I know that I'm going to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just want to thank you for, um, I want to thank you you for the way you live your life. Um, I think everyone who frees herself frees another because many of us can't even imagine freedom until we see somebody else doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you've done this in my life and I know that you've done it in many people's lives. You asking who benefits, who, who set up these rules? Wait, why do we have to do this? What if I don't want to do it this way? This doesn't feel good in my body. <laughs> I don't like this. I'm I'm going to pivot again. Um, every time you do that, and every time you're generous enough to do your learning in public, you allow other people to reimagine um, and to to dream their own lives. And like a benevolent virus, mm -hmm. the ideas of of actual transformation and liberation begin to to spread with with you at the center of it. And um, I'm just so grateful to get to be in your radius. I love you so very dearly. And I know I don't have to tell you this because I know that it's your true calling and your true nature and you'll never do anything but this, but never stop getting on the bus just to see where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, it's, it, it's who you are, it's what you do, and, and you take us all with you um, when you go on those journeys and, and you benefit all of us through that courage and that curiosity and, and that rare carbonated exuberance mm -hmm. that, um, <laughs> that you bring into every space that you enter and your and your great intelligence and and I haven't said it yet and I'll I'll close on this what a beautifully written book thank just you. writer to writer what a beautifully oh, written you. book so um everybody please if you haven't treated yourself yet <laughs> to a renaissance of our own by Rachel Elizabeth lively exuberance <laughs> optimism cargill please go check it out and Rachel thank you with all my heart for being on the onward book club and we love you 
Thank you, Liz. Thank you to the Onward Book Club. Thank you to the bookstore who hosted this event tonight. Um, all the, my team who's here, the local Akron people who came here. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful you're in my world as well, Liz. I love you so much. Thank you for being part, being on the bus with me um, in these journeys. I love these journeys with you. And um, I'll see. I'll see you. I'll see you soon. I'll see you. I'll see you. <laughs> Um, and, and everybody, thank you for tuning in mm -hmm. and to all who will watch this video later. Um, yes, I know we didn't get to do comments. So come into our, just tell us in our DMs how you felt. Exactly. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not Liz's. Liz, Liz, I, Liz is different. I was I, to say, did you DMs. just tell people no, to slip? Liz is different. I, I, Liz, I, I'm so sorry. I tell the story all the time. I love the difference between you and I because me and Liz will be at an event together and she'll be like, well, I'm going to head to bed. And I'm like, no, I have to talk to every single person who's in the room right now. So I'm so sorry. Do not. DM Liz, DM me, you and can. then I'll tell her about it over you coffee can, when we see each other. You can, you can, and I used to talk to every single person in the room, but after I got to a certain age, I was like, oh, yes, I'm she's now. like, I'm sleepy actually. <laughs> my body wants to sleep, and it's it's me and all of our mutual friends' favorite thing about you is that we know exactly when your bedtime is. nine o'clock. Yeah, the time exactly. is gonna come. We're forty five minutes away from uh, from Gilbert Down. Um, just I hope you not love you more, Rachel. Thank you so much for your generosity, for your brilliance, um, and for the light that you shine. And um, and thank you for everybody from the Onward Book Club. We 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 love you. And and thank you, Elizabeth of Akron, and everybody who's there live. Um, I love that we did a live show yes. tonight, and um, just many blessings to to all of you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye.